is uh, Seamus Milne. Seamus is a columnist and associate editor of the Garden newspaper, and uh, he edits uh, the comments uh, pages and had, has done that for six years. Um, he's also the author of The Enemy Within, MI5, Maxwell, and The Scargill Affair. Um, next to, uh, uh, to the right of Seamus um, is Andrew Gilligan, who's an old colleague uh, of mine from the BBC. Um, Andrew is best known um, for his 2003 report when he was the uh, defense and diplomatic affairs correspondent for the Today program on Radio 4 about the British government's briefing paper on uh, Iraq and uh, the supposed weapons of mass destruction, the so-called sexed-up dossier. Um, he's also gone on, I mean, since then, to work as a prolific writer and broadcaster for Channel 4, for whom he's done a number of dispatches and wide-ranging subjects, and, of course, the Evening Standard, um, and whose coverage of the uh, mayoral elections uh, you'll all know a lot about. So it's great to have him on the panel. Um, next to me um, here is uh, Peter Oborn, a prolific writer, broadcaster, commentator. He's um, written on a whole range of issues, but I suppose, I mean, very well known in this country for issues of civil liberties, on uh, Islamophobia, and of course on questions of political trust, of which he's covered in many, many uh, Channel 4 dispatches programs, as well as his writings in The Spectator, The Daily Mail, and much more besides. Last but not least, at the far end, is Wadda Khanfar, who is the Director General of Al Jazeera Networks, and that doesn't just include the flagship uh, Arabic channel, but also uh, Al Jazeera English, Sports, Mubashar, Documentary, and many others. But uh, Khanfar Wada is not just simply uh, an executive. He has been, until really quite recently, a frontline reporter for Al Jazeera, covering uh, extensive uh, issues, including, of course, uh, the... Uh, um, bombing and occupation of Iraq, um, after which he was uh, established as the Al Jazeera's Baghdad bureau chief um, and helping to rebuild that after the tragedy of the death of Tariq Ayyub um, as a result of the bombing of the Al Jazeera headquarters and uh, bureau in uh, Baghdad. Um, and uh, it's great to have all of them here to talk about this subject. Now, what we'd all like it to be is not just simply a discussion about, you know, what is journalistic impartiality in trying to come up with a definition. But to try and, I suppose, ask the question, you know, what are we all as journalists here for? What do we see our role? Is it as, you know, uh, an independent media there to protect our liberties and safeguard our democracies and our shared world? Or are we simply there to be as a mirror uh, and as a sort of a ticker tape almost of, of, of news events? Um, just again, the title, Media, Reporting the News or Setting the Agenda. So, first of all, I'd uh, like to ask Peter to go first and give his perspective on this subject. Um, yeah, I've, as a, as a jur journalist, um, it's terribly important to tell the truth. Uh, it's a very old-fashioned idea, that, and much uh, denigrated, but... Uh, the reason why I wanted to make the dispatches about Muslims in Britain so much was that I started to notice that there were so many stories in the British media which were simply untrue about Muslims. And I started to wonder, I wanted to go and investigate where all these stories came from, why did they get in the papers, how did they get in the papers, and why wasn't there more of a protest about it. Why was it acceptable for untrue stories to get into the papers? Uh, and uh, something I just wanted to add from a little bit earlier, I mean, I think this is a battle we have to fight. I, don't, I hope that the dispatches program, which, um, which I re pre presented earlier this week, I don't want it just to hap get happen uh, today and then just go away. I, I think it's very much part of a, what I hope will become a campaign, which is to just to ensure that there is decency and truthfulness and fairness in the reporting of Muslims, just as I would hope that there is decency and tr fairness about every other uh, community, every other section of British society. So in other words, it, what I'm really perhaps saying is that media 
the job of a journalist is not just to tell the truth, but to make sure that the truth gets told. And that's more of a campaigning thing. And to expose and to undermine the structures which exist inside the media, which mitigate against uh, the truth being told. Uh, there are all kinds of these structures, the power of the large media corporations, the enormous power of, of big business, the, the power of organized uh, lobbyism, one thing which can never be underestimated, which is sheer idleness and la laziness and incompetence, which uh, goes on a, a great deal of the time. But the ultimate belief, and I'm sure every single member of the panel will uh, agree with me, is simply that by telling the truth, however difficult, however painful it might be to some people, you are doing good because you're exposing your things which don't, people don't want to be, be known. Uh, and, and by doing that, you're increasing the fairness and equality and justice in the world. Thanks very much, Peter. <clears throat> Next, I'd like uh, to ask Seamus uh, to give his um, perspective. Thanks, Reg. I just wanted to say, uh, given that there's been quite a lot of criticism of this event in some parts of the media, and I think that reflects part of what we're talking about, that, it, that yeah, and it's been criticized for its uh, links with Islamism, that catch-all word which is now used to denigrate all sorts of political ideas in the Muslim community that I'm very privileged and proud to have been invited here and I think this is a very important event for dialogue, communication, it's exactly what we need. Uh, there's no doubt, as Peter's really excellent film showed earlier in the week, um, that since the London bombings in 2005, there has been an enormous increase in hostile coverage of uh, Muslim affairs, the Muslim community, uh, and the politics around that. Uh, I mean, the initial reaction, I think, in the country among ordinary people was actually quite calm. People understood where this had come from. Uh, but subsequently to that, there has been really an extraordinary campaign of vilification and denigration in the media, with taking a whole series of forms. And I think the result of that, very sadly, can be seen in the opinion polls, um, both taken uh, in the, the ICM poll, I think, that was used in Peter's program, but also in other polls, like the Harris poll last year, which showed the huge increase in Islamophobia in Britain, uh, which is now higher than in any other Western country, including France and the US. And I think that is a matter of shame for us uh, here. Um, so, of course, I mean, as Peter showed, I mean, the, the tabloid stories have been very extreme, often very mendacious, uh, and he gave a lot of uh, amusing examples. Uh, or maybe not so amusing, but, but certainly ridiculous. Uh, but there's also been a problem, I think, in the, the more upmarket end of the media, uh, in the Times and Telegraphs, and including in the broadcast media, of a series of stories which, while they may not themselves be inaccurate, tend to exaggerate disproportionately, sensationalize a series of phenomena in the Muslim community, in the mosques in this country, picking things and putting them out of all proportion so that many people, and, and this shows up in the polls as well, many non-Muslims in Britain have had no contact with Muslims. And so their, their perception of what Islam is and what, what, their, fe what their fellow citizens who are Muslim, Muslims are, are uh, fixed by what they're seeing through the media. And we have to remember that. And a particular case comes to mind which is, was exposed very effectively by Newsnight, uh, which I've had cause to criticize about its Muslim coverage in the past, but I think this was a very effective piece of work where it showed that a story which got front page coverage and was covered very heavily on the BBC and in, in other newspapers about uh, alleged extremism and extremist books and documents and videos and, and pamphlets being provided in British mosques, it showed that the evidence for the, that story, a good deal of it had been fabricated and falsified. And while this, the original story was on the front page of the Times, the Telegraph, and widely reported, the, the good work by Newsnight exposing what was really behind that, which had come from a right-wing think tank policy exchange, uh, got nothing like the same kind uh, of coverage. And of course, the common themes 
behind this kind of hostile coverage. We're all familiar with it. The exaggeration of the terror threat, the blurring of the distinctions between jihadism and Islamism, the building up of a sense of huge cultural differences and religious differences between people in this, uh, in this country. And I'd just like to say a, a short thing about what I think are some of the factors fueling this coverage, because I don't think it happens by coincidence. Uh, I think there is an agenda there. And the agenda, first of all, is to justify the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and the war on terror. Because, you know, part of the argument of those people who are pushing the war on terror <laughs> is that the people who are, who have been, make, you know, Al-Qaeda and the people who have been uh, launching terrorist atrocities around the world and in this country and elsewhere, that they're motivated by a hatred of Western freedom. Then it's not to do with the fact of that most people know to be the case in the Muslim world that it is arising out of the occupation and intervention uh, of Muslim lands and the support of dictatorship in those countries, but that it's actually all about hatred of freedom. And to justify that, you have to tell a story which exaggerates disproportionately certain trends within Islam and within the practice of Islam, tries to blur the distinction between conservative trends in religion and jihadism, and particular forms of jihadism that we've seen in the world. And there's another dimension of this, which I think we have to face squarely, which is that Islam has become, in the Western world in the last decade or more, uh, a kind of proxy for a more traditional form of racism. It, I mean, as we see in the BNP in this country, they're targeting, they're, they've switched their focus from their old attack on Jews and non-white people to Muslims. And they're very clear about why they're doing it. If you listen to Nick Griffin, he says, we must take advantage of the whipping up of anti-Muslim hysteria in the media and turn it to our advantage. And that is exactly uh, what is going on. So we know very well what the results on the streets are. As, as again shown in Peter's film, there have been an increase in violent attacks on Muslims and it shows up in throughout the statistics. And we've seen the kind of hysteria in politics and uh, it widely in the media. Now, what's the result of the re result of it? It's bad from the point of view of people who want an end to terror attacks against civilians in this country because it further alienates the community and it feeds a mentality which, feel, which leads people to think that they have no other alternative. It's bad for social cohesion in Britain. It's bad for you know community relations, and everyone can see that. But in the in the Islamophobia, I've been. Uh, describing and it's also bad from the point of view of the necessary change in foreign policy that is going to have take, to take place in this country and in the West more widely if we're going to have a more peaceful uh, uh, world. So it's a dangerous situation but I personally don't think there's need for despair about it. I think the very fact that Newsnight and Dispatches have, have made some excellent programs exposing what's been going on is a cause for uh, some hope. And I think we need much more pressure on the media to continue that kind of work. And obviously, we in the media need to intensify that ourselves. But there also needs to be pressure in politics. And one of the things that's been a bit unfortunate, I think one of the unfortunate results of the Islamophobic campaign in the media in politics of the last two or three years has been that many Muslim activists in the community who became very active in the anti-war movement and in politics more widely, in mainstream politics more widely, after 2001, understandably, many of them feel intimidated and have wanted to keep their heads down. But I'm afraid I think we can't really afford that. It's the most positive thing that's happened in relations between the Muslim community, I think, and the, the wider community in this country, and we need to rebuild that. And finally, I think Muslims themselves, and this is maybe an unfair thing to say, but I think it's necessary, need themselves to organize to put more pressure on the media. There are all sorts of of points of pressure that can be put on the BBC, which is under a statutory duty, but on newspapers as well, to report more fairly, to not to indulge in Islamophobic uh, hysteria and whipping up of hatred. And I think, you know, with the support of progressive forces in the country more generally, I think that can have a result, and we've seen results. So I think there, there are, is a way forward, although things are looking a bit grim at the moment. Thank you very much, Seamus. And uh, next to Andrew Gilligan. It's, uh, it's hard to deny that 
parts of our media tell straightforward lies about Muslims. And uh, Peter's film illustrated a couple of examples. The, uh, the report in The Sun in March, for instance, that a bus driver ordered his passengers off the bus in order to praise a Mecca. It actually turned out the bus had been taken out of service by an inspector because it was running late. The passengers had been put on the one behind, and the driver of the first bus had taken the opportunity to pray. Um, the story about the house occupied by soldiers in Iraq um, uh, who'd recently returned from Iraq, which was vandalized um, by, allegedly by Muslims angry about the Iraq war. Well, the house had been vandalized, but there was no evidence whatsoever that it was done by Muslims, and the police, in fact, say that it was, it was not. So we can talk about those sort of stories, but much more serious, I think, um, because it's not confined to red-top tabloid fantasy land, is the what we see from time to time, um, anti-Muslim moral panics. Um, one of the most worrying and extraordinary was the, the Great Veil furore in October 2006. And now, moral panics are always bonkers, but uh, th that one really was in a class of its own. Um, uh, any traditional old English media frenzy usually requires uh, at least some actual event, you know, two toddlers, savaged by a dangerous dog in the same news cycle or a traveler convoy approaching Isha or whatever, but not that one. For a few weeks, British Muslims became the new hoodies, the new Rottweilers, the new video nasties without actually doing anything, as far as I could tell, to provoke it. Um, you'll remember that it was set off by an article by Jack Straw in which he, he said he didn't want to see his constituents if they dressed in veils, and that triggered a whole series of accusations. David Davis, um, now father of liberty, of course, but uh, then the shadow home secretary accused Muslims of creating a, quote, kind of voluntary apartheid, unquote. Trevor Phillips, the, the head of what was then the Commission for Racial Equality, warned that failing to debate race segregation would, quote, bring civil strife and fire to our streets and spoke of, quote, black holes, fully fledged ghettos, crime, no-go areas, and chronic cultural conflict with the walls going up around many of our communities. Now, those are widely held beliefs in the British public, damaging beliefs, but they are, in fact, wrong. All the experts on British segregation, such as Professor Kerry Peach of Oxford University, um, describe Philip's view as alarmist. They all say that the most commonly used statistical measure shows actually decreasing or stable degrees of segregation in British cities. And there are very few areas indeed, particularly in London, where a single ethnic minority or faith group dominates. Even in the most non-white places, there is usually a mix of Muslims and Hindus or Asians and blacks. And far from growing levels of crime and conflict, race attacks in London actually fell by 10% last year. So, so what do you do about it? Well, the straightforward lie solutions stories, the solution is pretty simple, actually. It's, uh, it's quite hard work, but it's simple. You complain reasonably, factually, in a low-key way, but persistently. And some people say, I know that complaining doesn't work, but actually, newspapers, on newspapers, dealing with complaints is a significant headache. And if on a particular story you have the facts on your side and the willingness to keep going, the papers will be less willing to take a pot shot at you in the future. But it needs to be factual and reasonable. The problem with the broader moral panic type stories, though, is that they are not really set off by the media. They're set off by politicians and their appointees. You might say, and I certainly do say, that the media needs to develop much more of a willingness to think, a willingness to resist a political bandwagon. But the media, I think, in these cases is only a symptom of the broader problem, which is political. Now, be in no doubt, I'm not blaming you for what happens, mostly. I don't think the Muslim community is mainly to blame for these attacks. They are mainly the work of others. But part of the reasons a politician can get away with them um, Part of the reason politicians get away with the kind of attacks made by Straw and Davis is that the Muslim community in this country is not politically represented to its best advantage. Um, I agree with the critique recently made by one of the country's leading Muslim thinkers, Yahya Burt. And he says that the community, and specifically the MCB, and its, many of its affiliates, has failed to frame its own proactive narratives about terror and segregation and the economic plight of many in the Muslim community. I happen to think, for instance, that economics, class, explains at least as much as faith why some Muslims turn terrorist. Uh, it's very noticeable there is a difference in 
radicalization between British Arabs and British Pakistanis. They're both Muslims, but one community is middle class and the under, other largely working class. Now, you can't rely on the media to ferret out that kind of distinction. You can't rely on the media not to treat Muslims as one um, homogeneous block. You can't rely on the media to ferret out the real facts about segregation, class, uh, and the diverse nature of the community. You need to be doing it yourselves in, in a factual, reasoned way that might help influence the media agenda. The community needs, and I accept, is starting to develop its own versions of think tanks, its counterparts, if you like, to the policy exchanges. You need to be having the intellectual debate at the likes of Trevor Phillips showing up where they are factually wrong. Now, I won't go into the argument about whether the MCB is too close to radical Islamist movements, and I believe they are. Uh, but I also very much agree with another of Yaya Burt's points, which is that some of the affiliates particularly have behaved in politically counterproductive ways. The community should be trying to build better links with all political parties. Um, the performance, for instance, of the BMI, British Muslim Initiative's Muslims for Ken campaign during the recent London election was lamentable. It, it made the community look like the sectarian plaything of one candidate. Um, and indeed, as Burt says, association with the old left is hardly the best political positioning for a non-party institution that's preparing to deal with an incoming government that might well be conservative. When we talk about the media, I think we need to develop a sharp distinction between the kind of, of lies I've been describing and some of the media criticism of Britain's Muslim leadership, which I think is entirely proper. Attacks on the MCB are not necessarily Islamophobic, and indeed the media can possibly be an ally in developing a slightly more nuanced position for, the Brit for Br Britain's Muslim community. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. And uh, finally, but not least, uh, Wada. Thank you very much. Telling the truth, questioning centers of power, and informing the public are definitely conventional duties of journalists. However, I tend to believe that in a situation that we are going through, uh, and I'm coming from a region, the Middle East, uh, that is going through chaos and anarchy right now, I think it is not enough that media only deliver facts and truth and information. I do believe that we have a duty of equipping our audience or the public with the tools to understand and to gain real knowledge about what is happening. I think we need to develop some kind of explanatory tools, explanatory paradigm where people could use in order to interpret facts. Facts and data sometimes could become accurate lies because it, it may not really lead into a proper understanding of reality or knowledge. Therefore, we need at this moment in time to tackle issues regarding complicated situation. Take, for example, Iraq, Palestine, Afghanistan, the war in terrorism, and issues related to minorities and to other cultures and civilizations. We need to tackle it with a lot of depth and a lot of understanding. And we need to stop looking at others from above. We need to go down to the public to the people and understand from within what is really happening and try to project that to the public. I'm saying so not because I feel that Muslims are under uh, uh, represented or covered by media in the West, which is true, but I'm saying so because I think this is the best approach for all parties to reach some kind of understanding of each other and to sort a lot of complicated issues that are rising and harming the interest of all parties. The issue of Iraq, for example, as we see it right now today, and the whole coverage of media from September 2001 until maybe today is going through a real crisis. Real crisis because it seems to me that a lot of us journalists have been, you know, trying to go hand in hand with the political discourse of the time. And therefore, with more political and even commercial priorities of the profession that we belong to, we are sacrificing a lot of values 
that one day the, father, the, father, the founders of this profession stood for and they regard it as sacred. Therefore, we need to go back to these kind of foundations and to honor it and to reintroduce to the public something that stands for you know, uh, proper journalism. I'm saying so also because I have come from a region and you know, I think you, have, you know on a daily basis what is happening in Iraq and in, in, uh, in Palestine and many other parts of the Middle East. And I have noticed while I was working as a reporter how my colleagues sometimes view realities. First of all, a lot of journalists arrive there without real knowledge about this region. Reading or browsing through the internet to gain a little bit of information about, about regions that we are going to cover, or nations, or cultures, or complicated stories, and reading Wikipedia and few other you know, touristic sites is not going to enable us to really understand what is happening. It's not going to equip us with explanatory paradigm of looking deep into the story. Without understanding the history, for example, of regions and cultures and civilizations that we are dealing with, without understanding the specific priorities of the, of the collective mind, of the collective memory of the nation that we deal with, we can never analyze events and we cannot at all predict or foresee how the future will be. That is important for us. When I was covering the story on Iraq, I could see in the minds of the public there how they were looking at the American occupation of Iraq. And I could see the terms of the Mughals and the burning of, 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 Iraq, of Baghdad and the, the, the uh, accumulative memory of the public surfacing and becoming analytical tool of understanding the occupation. And I think politicians and journalists did not understand how powerful history could be in the reality of, of the Iraqis at that moment in time, and the Afghanis and many other nations as well in the region. That is very important for us to realize. Second issue, which in my opinion is very important as well, tolerance, we need it right now at this moment in time. Not as a public relations, not as a political discourse that could, you know, decorate our speeches here and there. We need it because without it, we are going to suffer, all of us. And in order to gain this kind of tolerance, we need really to respect specificities. We need to respect cultures, civilizations, as I said, from within. And we need to stop looking at others from above and treating these cultures and civilizations from point of view, from one single point of view that eliminates richness and eliminates great ideas and values that were developed through time and through history. So I have just arrived actually from uh, you know, a trip which was a visit to Andalusia in, in Spain for 10 days with my family, just I went there for, for a holiday. And I was contemplating about the great civilization that for 800 years governed that part of, the, of Europe. And when I visited Cordoba, and I sat in the mosque, the ancient mosque of Cordoba, and I know very much about the ancient mosque of Cordoba, I remembered how the Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians sat together in the circles of knowledge, in front of the masters and philosophers like Ibn Rushd and like many others of that time. And then they exchanged and they learned and then they transferred knowledge to Europe and to many other parts of the world. The acknowledgement of these kind of specificities and the respect for cultures could create real paradigm of tolerance. Without that, we are not going to achieve this kind of harmony in, in the world that we are living in. I have seen in Cordoba and in Granada and in many other parts of Andalusia, you know, 
mosques, churches, and synagogues of people who lived for 800 years in harmony, and they were able to develop this kind of understanding. And then science, culture, poetry, and art flourished. Until today, when you go there, you feel amazed by the glory of the culture and civilization that existed out of this harmony and coexistence and this kind of relationship that flourished in, in a country amongst, across faiths, faiths and cultures and civilizations. In my opinion, this paradigm always could be achieved. And we journalists right now should work hard in order to push forward for this understanding and for this mutual coexistence. Unfortunately, yes, less and less resources right now are put in the hands of editors and executives to send teams here and there in order to dig deep and to understand these kind of issues. Sometimes we prefer to send our cameraman with the reporter for a couple of days with a few hundred dollars in order to do something and to come back. That is not going to help the cause of coexistence. It is not going to achieve the, the goals of journalism as well. Definitely, we need to do much more than looking at our profession as commercial opportunity to make some money by the end of the month. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wada, and thanks to all uh, the rest of our panel. Now it's over to you um, for questions. I can already see some hands up. If you could hold them up high, I think there's going to be roving microphones, um, and just wait till they come to you. We've got two here already, that gentleman on the edge, uh, there in the blue jacket. And if you've got specific questions addressed to specific panelists, please do uh, say so. Hi, Saqib Moin. Mr. Gilligan, I also read Yahya Bert's article, and he started I can't hear off. You. Can, you, can you speak up a bit? Yeah. Sorry. Saqib Moin, I also read Yahya Bert's article, and he started off by saying that MCV was the preeminent Muslim organization in this country. It's also the most diverse Muslim organization in this country. Um, and I also agree with him that there needs to be internal change within the MCV to reflect the changes in the community. I disagree with you, and I disagree with Yahya Bert. Um, on this assumption that the MCV endorsed Ken Livingston. It didn't. Go and read Asim Siddiqui's article in the same comment is free, and he'll tell you that. And I'd like you to point to me any MCV statement, not s affiliates of MCV, that have made that case that MCV supports Ken Livingston. What I said in my speech was that affiliates of the MCB had supported Ken Livingston. Well, affiliates also include supporters of the Conservative Party. I haven't finished my point yet. Aff affiliates have, uh, have also support the Conservative Party. Mr. Zaidi, who was a member of the Central Working Committee, is a, le a leading member and was those who, one of those who endorsed Boris Johnson. So, uh, you really need to give some evidence when you make those statements. Well, look, the Final reason, point. The reason I used the word affiliates was that's because of what, what it was. Final it was a point. Very prominent campaign. Sorry, a final point on a note of optimism. I think we need to move beyond the, the terror narrative. For too long, our community has been defined through the narrow prism of security. I think some of our journalists aren't helping. They see us through the, the story, do we provide a security story? Not where are the good practice? Where, where, are the go where is the good news? For example, the Muslim News has, for the last 10 years, done um, achievement awards for good practice around the country. Where are journalists in terms of looking at these things and saying, yeah, that's what's going on in the community? Okay, thanks very much. I think we'll, I appreciate there's a lot of issues that we all want to get into, but if we could just try and ask questions specifically of our panelists, um, uh, uh, that would make, you know, give as many people a chance to, 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 to get their voices heard. So. Not as many sort of statements, uh, if I could put it as delicately as that, would be helpful. There's a gentleman there in the second row, and there's also uh, a gentleman there in the middle afterwards as well. Uh. Um Good evening, everyone. Um, it's, I'm going to try and stick to one point, and uh, one point I'm, I'm just That'd going be good. to. <laughs> one point I'm going to stress. And um, I think in this dialogue, and hopefully through like, the next four days, that people actually do mention the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was, and as God points out in the Quran, a perfect example for mankind. And it's the Prophet Muhammad that in the Hadith, 
you said that a lie would spread twice around the world before people would recognize it to be the truth. This was said 1400 years ago. And it's very ringing very, very true to that statement and that effect right now. What my question to the panelists, and it goes to every single panelist member there, is that has the damage not already been done in the sense of reporting Muslim issues, this whole issue of Islam in this country? Because for so long the media have been so inactive in engaging with the Muslim community or Islam in general. And now when it has come to a, a particular point and a disastrous event in, in, the, in Britain, that the media reporting has not done the fair justice in pre-event and now post-reporting of that event. Peter, you spoke earlier about, I mean, when you saw a lot of the stories printed about Muslims that were clear to you just simply weren't true, you wanted to understand why that was, where it come from, and then you sent, you know, try and disis, you know, break down those, you know, uh, factors that led to it. I mean, is that still possible or is the pessimistic note that the gentleman sort of struck, you know, no, that the damage has already been done? No, I, I really uh, disagree that the damage has already been done. Damage has been done, but it's very possible. And I think it must be done. I think we must campaign to make sure that this the culture has changed. Actually, if you go back uh, through history, you can see uh, periods when uh, other minorities in British media have been vilified and been the subject of uh, hatred. I mean, the, the Jews were covered in a very similar way to which Muslims are covered uh, now in, in, in before the Second World War. Um, we showed that in the film, actually, the same, almost exactly the same language, exactly the same libels. I think that it's fair to say that black communities in Britain were covered in a, in a really foul way uh, until the 1970s. And by we have become much more civilized, and I'm sure, certain that this culture we have in Britain today must be broken down, and, and I'm, I'm sure it will, and it's, I think it's the job of all of us in this room to make sure it is. Uh, thank you very much. Seamus, you spoke, I mean, uh, one thing that really got my attention early on that we said was that Islam has become almost a proxy for an acceptable form of racism. You quote, quoted Nick Griffin. And I think for a lot of Muslims who are here, um, it's a sense in which this is an acceptable form of racism, but at, across all sort of social sort of strata, it's prevalent in, you know, middle class dinner table circles as well as, you know, elsewhere. I mean, is that, would you say, true? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, I think some people kid themselves that, you know, because Islam is a religion and religions are a set of ideas that somehow it can be separated from people's culture, identity, and nature. And so I think there, there's a group of, for example, secular liberals in Britain who take their secularism to a very extreme uh, level. And they think that you know, because Islam is a set of ideas and they don't believe in religion, that they can therefore legitimately pour scorn and abuse on Islam and Muslims. Uh, without in any way crossing the line over into racism or xenophobia. And I think that's, you know, they're completely deluding themselves. I, I mean, this is, you know, Islamophobia and the hatred of Muslims is a form of racism. It's a particular form of racism in our time. And, uh, you know, the, the BNP understands that better than a lot of these uh, secular liberals. But I mean, I agree very much with what Peter was saying. And I think the, the Jewish uh, example is a very interesting one. I mean, both because of the incredible similarities before the First World mm -hmm. War. I mean, including down to the point about terrorism. I mean, the part of the reason the mm -hmm. Jewish community here was abused was because of its uh, links with anarchist terrorists and so on. Uh, but I mean, the, the very place we're sitting in now, Olympia, in 1934 was the, the, the site of a massive fascist rally by the British Union of Fascists, mm -hmm. which was the, the BNP of its day, but a lot more powerful and a lot more threatening, and that its main target was the Jewish community in Britain, and uh, there was a lot of violence used in this hall to throw out protesters. And the next day, the banner headline on the front page of the Daily Mail, might be familiar to some of you, was hurrah for the black shirts, which was hurrah for the fascists. And so we have been here before, not in exactly the same way, but it does show how these things can be reversed. And I, I would want to emphasize, I think this particular period of Islamophobia is connected with migration and other issues, but it's most of all connected with the war on terror, the Middle East, the occupation of Muslim lands, and an attempt to give justification 
and underpinning for that. So I think there is a very intimate connection with what's going on in Wadah's part of the world and uh, in Palestine, Iraq, Afghanistan and the wider Muslim world. And we, we shouldn't lose sight of that because I think that is what is really behind it. Okay, thanks very much. Gentleman there uh, in the middle. And then we'll go to the lady right at the back holding her arm up, waving there. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, can I begin by saying to Peter, excellent dispatches documentary. Uh, and uh, that was something that brought actually tears to my eyes, uh, that presenting that truth as it was. Thank you for that. My question is to Seamus, that you highlighted that Muslim community should be doing more to uh, get the media uh, to work for them and pressure the media. Uh, going back a couple of years, um, uh, following the 7-7 event, the Muslim community in Finsbury Park, no less, put out full-page adverts in The Guardian, The Times, The Sun, and 16 cities in the metro condemning the event, which was hardly picked up by the wider media community. How can we uh, actually do more? Uh, that's something that, uh, the Muslim, uh, what would you suggest that we can do more? And secondly, my question is to Andrew uh, regarding uh, Evening Standard. Evening Standard at times has been at the forefront of vil vilifying the Muslim community. What can, um, what can journalists of your standards who understand the emerging ignorance and Islamophobia that exists within our community, that is being normalized within the British community, which is a very dangerous kind of uh, situation that we're in, how can the journalists like yourselves do more to bring about you know, a better optimized form of journalism within those uh, sectors. Okay, uh, Seamus first, and then we'll move to Andrew. Yeah, I mean, just to pick, I mean, I, I was slightly hesitant about saying Muslims should do more because I know that Muslims are the ones under the caution. and it's, uh, it's, it's not really maybe reasonable to make such uh, demands. I'm, I'm, I just think that it is possible to push back this tide. It is possible for pressure to be applied all over the place, like Andrew was saying. I mean, it, these complaints and these, you know, protests and uh, lobbying campaigns do have an effect. Not always immediately, not always in the most obvious way. The, the papers and the TV station may not always capitulate, but I think we all know from having worked in newspapers and worked in, in broadcasting that those things do have an impact. And uh, so, I mean, I, I completely appreciate your point, you know, that the Muslim community made every attempt after the 7th of July bombings to make its position clear, and it didn't stop a, a torrent of abuse being poured over it. But I think that there are lots of, you know, patient, painstaking work that can be done to challenge articles, to challenge broadcasts, to challenge uh, ab abuse and misrepresentation that is going on all the time. Of course, we should be doing more, but I think, you know, it's in all our interests, Muslims and non-Muslims, that this tide is turned back, and I think it can be. Yeah, one, of the, um, one of the views of the media that, um, that one, of, one of the views of the media that, that, that's prevalent is, is a, of a kind of ravening beast with a, with a ferocious intelligence of its own that, that chews people up. I, I want to put uh, an alternative hypothesis that the media is actually rather weak and feeble and is in fact a plaything of other forces. Um, mostly uh, the state, the, uh, the military, um, uh, uh, politics and various kinds. Um, but actually, it could be your plaything as well if you wanted to do it right. Now, I I'll, give you the I'll give you one particular example on the Finsbury Park example. There's a, there's a man called Norman Brennan who runs something called the Victims of Crime Trust um, who, uh, who's constantly on the radio and television literally hundreds of times a year calling for stiffer sentences and people to be locked up and all the rest of it. Now, the Victims of Crime Trust has one member, Norman Brennan. Um, the, the only reason he gets on TV is he doesn't represent anyone. He doesn't represent anything like as many people as any Muslim organization represents. The only reason he gets on TV is he's always ringing them up and offering to go on. Um, uh, and his number is in all their Rolodexes. And he's a plausible spokesperson. He looks good. He says the right things. Uh, and actually, if the Finsbury Park people had, uh, had, had, had had a plausible spokesperson who kept ringing up the TV producers and kept ringing up the radio producers, they'd have probably got on as well. Because actually, most, most TV and radio producers, I have to tell you, are relatively liberal. They don't want to constantly, um, they don't want to constantly peddle a view of all Muslims as, as, as would-be terrorists, because they know it's wrong and they don't like it anyway. They'd be more than happy if somebody was, if somebody was willing to put themselves up to do that. Um, so, so it, don't think of the media in quite the way that, that you've sometimes been encouraged to think of it. It's actually, 
increasingly enfeebled um, as it's being uh, more and more deprived of resources, and that is a potential opportunity for you guys. Thank you very much. That's an excellent point. Uh, I want to ask you what, though. I mean, you're the head of the Al Jazeera sort of networks, and the points that Andrew was making, and Shamus, and or in fact, Peter as well. How does it work on a day to day basis? Are media organizations very prone and open to you know, manipulation and force, whether it's through lobby groups, governments, the military, pushing their time and trying to grab their message and push it again and again and again? Is it, is it a plaything, as, as, as uh, Andrew sort of quippishly put it? No doubt. Actually, I think that if we are not very cautious and if we do not equip our journalists, our newsrooms, and our editors, with necessary understanding of the profession that they belong to, and necessary commitment, and also with necessary knowledge of the stories that they are covering, they could easily be manipulated by many forces in the society. Sometimes even by the public, you know, anger that could happen. And I'm speaking right now about Al Jazeera, Arabic, for example, and the way that we have seen for ourselves the anger on the streets of Cairo, and Damascus and Baghdad during the war in Iraq, for example, or the war in Afghanistan, because you do not expect at that moment in time the people to be diplomats. So you will see, you will hear voices and you will see people and you will see the anger in front of you, you know. So if you are not a reporter who could really locate this anger and frustration in proper analytical mind, you could also be manipulated and then you could reflect what is happening? You are really reporting what is happening on the ground. But this reporting is not very much, you know, uh, is, is not going to lead to a proper knowledge of the reality because you need to put it in the framework. Politicians in the Arab world, for example, during the last few decades have manipulated media. People in, in actually audience in the Arab world could not believe that Al Jazeera is an independent TV station because for their, for during their entire life, the Arab governments were manipulating you know, media, and therefore they have never ever understood media but the voice of the ruling elite. So definitely there is, I mean, therefore we need to protect our profession. Yes, we cannot, we don't have the power, we don't have the, we are not like governments, uh, authoritarian governments in particular, for example, in societies where they are not yet democratized, but at, at the end of the day, we have a mission as journalists. And in my opinion, what protects us in these circumstances is the commitment of our audience and the love of our audience and the fact that our audience believe in us. That protects us, although governments, centers of powers, and many other forces could try to pressurize us and to manipulate us. Thank you very much. A lady at the back there. luck we can't really hear you unfortunately let's try and quickly get that other mic to you if not we'll move to someone else unfortunately that's better go on hello great <laughs> would the panel agree that the BBC is institutionally racist in terms of its broadcasting and recruitment of BME communities and also what do journalists value the most, money or morals? Right, fairly straightforward question. <laughs> well, we'll try and deal with this uh, as quickly as, as, as possible. Uh, let's just, uh, does, has anyone got, want to start on that? Or? Well, I'd, I'd have to say the money, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I concur. Um, Seamus, I mean, I mean, I think the broader point is, I mean, what, what do people make of the sort of BBC sort of coverage? I know the Newsnight sort of thing has been sort of in, in the headlines sort of recently. I don't think any of us can sort of comment on the wider point, but what do you make of what the lady was saying? I'm um, just on the uh, racism uh, point. I mean, as somebody who's been active in the NUJ for many years, I'm, I'm sure that all media, media organizations have a very long way to go in improving the participation and representation of minorities in the country. Uh, and uh, the BBC is absolutely no exception to that. Um, as to its wider role, I mean, I think we have to remember that the, the BBC is, in the end, a state broadcaster. Uh, I mean, and it, it operates under a, a quite effective protection, but as, as um, Andrew is uh, witness to, and uh, uh, 
you know, the very fact that as a result of the Iraq war, the BBC chairman and director general were forced out while uh, Tony Blair, who was shown to have been gone to war on a false pretext in an, in an illegal act of aggression, you know, stayed out his time. I think that you know, shows you where the balance of power lies. However, I mean, this is to come back to the point we were talking about how to put pressure on media organizations. I think the fact that it's got a long tradition of being partly arm's length from government and that there are all sorts of mechanisms within it for balancing and, and, and pluralism, you know, we need to use those. I mean, the fact that it's not you know, an ideal independent uh, broadcaster floating somewhere around, uh, you know, above society doesn't mean that it's not an extremely important public institution which, which operates under a statutory arrangement which gives a, a unique kind of access and means of pressures and, and influence. So I think, you know, you've got to see both sides of it. And, and I think the BBC is a very important institution in this country which gives a lot of possibilities. So for all the things, the negative things that you can say about it, uh, I mean, if it was to be abolished, it would be a big loss. And we've got lots of ways we can influence it. Uh, Just very, very briefly, briefly to add on the BBC, I work for the Daily Mail as, uh, not nearly as bad on Muslims, by the way, as Ken Livingstone and others have said. It's, uh, but uh, it's not supposed to like the BBC. I'll tell you why, it's an awful lot better than almost any alternative. Um, just think of having Fox News or something like that uh, broadcasting to us. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. There's a lady with a red shirt there in the middle holding her hand up, and then afterwards uh, we'll go to that gentleman in the, in the blue tank top there. Hello. Um, I'm actually a journalist myself. I um, work for BBC London, and a question that I'm asked a lot is, um, as a Muslim, can I trust, for example, Al Jazeera over BBC? And I guess my question is, is the value of truly neutral, bias-free news a myth? Or are Muslims going to be, be better represented, say, on Al Jazeera than BBC? And s my second point, very quickly, is also, isn't the problem about the language, the discourse we use when we talk about the Muslim community, term terminology like jihadism, um, uh, Islamic terrorism, um, Islamism? Uh, you know, what does this mean? And do these definitions mean anything to anyone? And if they do, are they correct to be used? constantly in terms of the Muslim community. Well done. You know, I think, first of all, uh, the issue of free and independent media, all of us should aspire as journalists, and I think we should, as I said, work hard in order to achieve the highest standards of, of achieving uh, uh, independence, although it is very difficult. And I think at this moment in time, while we are talking to you, you know, we have hundreds of journalists all over the world, facing a lot of difficulties, including jail, sometimes even murder or kidnapping. It is not becoming very easy for us to, uh, to, to go around and to cover stories. Just a few weeks ago, we have received our colleague, Sami Al-Hajj, who spent six and a half years in Guantanamo. And after six and a half years, he was released without any charges or without any accusation and without any apology. Of course, unfortunately, you know, uh, coming from Spain, one of the Spanish newspapers, the headline was as follows. Al Jazeera, uh, or uh, Al Jazeera cameraman, Al Jazeera, the terrorist Al Jazeera cameraman is released. <laughs> the terrorist Al Jazeera cameraman is released. Why? Simply because there is a, some kind of, uh, you know, stereotyping that's taking place. And people, until this moment in time, are not really digging deep in order to understand certain kind of stories. In order to answer the other issue, in, in my opinion, uh, some terminologies that emerged uh, during the last eight years, like terrorism and Islamism and many other terminologies, are very simplistic and at the same time they are very superficial and reductionist. And therefore, in Al Jazeera, we don't use all these terminologies. When it comes to terrorism, for example, we use it be, you know, between inverted commas or uh, uh, we, we do not you know, describe any person or any movement uh, or any action as, as a, a terrorist. And therefore, we leave it for the public to decide. Uh, so therefore, when we speak about the situation in Iraq, we, we describe it as it is. There are military groups, for example, in Iraq, and there is explosion here or there. And let the public decide for themselves. Politically charged terminology is not suitable for us uh, journalists to use, because in my opinion, it might 
mislead uh, the public and could give them indirectly certain kind of messages that it is not our duty to, to judge uh, these kind of issues. To conclude, I think also one of the problems that we are facing is the so-called analysts. You know, I see often some people called Middle Eastern analysts or analysts of, on issues related to the Middle East. And I'm afraid that a lot of networks do pick up certain people who, who belong to the margin, who are not really truly representative of the main trend thinking in the Arab world or the Muslim world. And therefore, because maybe they, they, they subscribe to certain kind of understanding, to a certain kind of views regarding the Arab world or the Islamic world, they are hosted often. And they are misleading the public. Because when I hear them analyzing and giving information and certain kind of stories, I laugh really. Because they are really misleading the public. And therefore, if we would like to be more accurate in our reporting or in understanding reality, let us talk to the men, to the people who represent the main trend, the people who represent the center, the people who really, you know, could give proper and accurate understanding of what is really happening on the ground, rather than bringing some kind of people who just try to promote themselves and to promote their books or to promote their research without, uh, in order to please, actually, <laughs> certain circles politically and not telling the truth. That's a very good point, actually, the point about analysts. It would be great to get into a bit more. But the other, the second point that the lady was making was the use, uh, and I'd like to put this to you, Andrew, of language and phraseology like jihadism and, you know, Islamic terrorism and, you know, so forth, almost as buzzwords rather than anything that carries any meaning or people necessarily understand. And that's in, you know, headlines and articles and, you know, broadcasts daily. Um, what kind of effect do you think that that has? And why do you think that there is journalists reach for those kind of things so readily? Well, um, there's clearly a major problem with the imprecise use of language like you know, Muslim terrorists. And, and those two words don't, don't um, belong together. But I, I know a lot of people have um, problems with the word Islamism. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't. I mean, I, I take the view I, I, Islamism is actually pretty well defined dictionary definition, a definition of Islamism is there. Um, it, is, um, it, it is reasonably widely understood. Um, it, it doesn't mean Islamic. It doesn't mean, you know, is, an Islamist is not the same thing as a Muslim. Um, uh, and I think, but I think a lot of people assume it is. Okay, let's move on. That gentleman there in the blue coat. And then we're going to go to the gentleman near the front here uh, afterwards. Go ahead. Um, it's Mustafa Chowdhury. Just wanted to know, um, when Peter was making the dispatches program, because um, it was really refreshing, um, did you get any obstacles to, did you get any obstacles to making the program? Um, was there any kind of pressure put on you in any way from within the, the media world? I'm just trying to kind of understand how things operate and why isn't there kind of more of the same coming along? No, I don't think um, we had any obstacles uh, put in our way once we started on the idea at all. Some people wouldn't be interviewed by us. Um, I invited my Daily Mail colleague, uh, Melanie Phillips, for instance, but she um, wouldn't come on. So, uh, And there was a certain amount of legal difficulty with some of the stories um, because there are as I'm sure everybody in this room is very well aware you know attacks on Muslims and some of the court cases ongoing made it impossible uh, to tell the truth about those attacks um, you, know, or, you know things have come to trial on you know that that sort of thing legal difficulties but uh, in general, um, we got immensely good cooperation from everybody, actually. Was it Thank hard you. program to get off the ground? I mean, did, to try and sort of com get it commissioned, did, was it a long struggle or was, <laughs> was it fairly? It was quite, actually, I'll tell you what happened. I uh, went and saw Dorothy Byrne. I'd had a sort of, actually, I'd had a sort of meeting with a producer, the following, um, um, what are they called? The executive producer, a man who runs one of these production companies. 
And we, I put about five ideas together. And I bumped into Dorothy, not, not one of them was this, and I bumped into Dorothy Byrne, the head of news and current affairs at Channel 4. And I said, I, I really want to think you really ought to do a piece exposing the lies that get written about and said about Muslims. But an hour later, she came back, yeah, we're doing it. <laughs> it, it was very, very quick. Automatic commission. Yeah. Well, that's good. Um, move to that gentleman there in the Lonsdale blue jacket, and then uh, afterwards to this gentleman here at the front uh, in the blue jacket. Go ahead. Um, just going to uh, give a little bit of a, a highlight to how uh, a small independent producer um, might suffer under the uh, commissioning system. Um, not more than about two or three years ago, I came back into independent filmmaking and was confronted with a situation where I've got a perfectly decent idea about perhaps the fundamentalism of atheists. Great idea. Sorry, somebody was already doing it. The ideas get nicked. Quite often, if it, even if you're coming in from a ground level, there is a kind of a nepotistic tendency, which we're all quite aware of. Not only within the BBC, which is a family in itself, which doesn't want to often uh, go outside, and, but also amongst uh, independent filmmakers. And PACT and the whole independent film scene has got to be scrutinized as well. Because the truth is that everybody pretty much knows that around about five, six years ago within the industry, that the larger independent film production c uh, companies pretty much gazumped all the small scale stuff that was going on, certainly in Channel 4, during the early days of Channel 4. And I think that's a serious, serious mistake. Now, that's one thing that I, I wanted to point out. And the question is, how do you regulate independent production companies? How do you bring that whole system in, into, into an accountability? The second, second point, I think is very important, is a criticism of the Muslim community. And possibly, uh, it's a pretty obvious thing, but Western society, by and large, um, and grassroots, working class uh, Western society, uh, operates and, and thinks through art and culture far more easily than going at them with scholasticism and religion. So, what role can art and culture play in terms of attracting your PR, your marketing, etc.? Let's think along those lines. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, it's, it's a quite a sort of careful and, you know, detailed question about sort of how the media works and production companies. Um, but what I want to sort of, I want to broaden it out, basically, and ask the question of, of our panelists. How do you, and is it possible to get alternative views and voices on the national media, newspapers and otherwise, uh, uh, broadly it onto this question of, of Islamophobia and, and holding politicians uh, uh, to, 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 to task about it. Peter. Um, it's a very limited pool. I mean, we, you know, the three of you, four of you have done it, but I mean, do you see more and more, is, is this something that pe journalists are beginning to sort of actually say something yep. has gone wrong? Uh, we need to dig deep and find out why these stories that are patently not true are getting through. Well, I think because uh, it is noticeable that uh, Muslims are poorly represented in the national media. I think I'm right in saying that the only regular Muslim uh, columnist on the national paper is Yasmin Alibi Brown. Is that true? I, uh, I, I think that, and that is quite striking given that, you know, Muslims maybe c compose 5% of the population, that they just have one, one newspaper columnist. So that there, is a, um, there is an issue um, there. Also, I think there is a question of perception. That is actually a blindness uh, to Muslim stories at the moment, i.e. if Muslims get attacked, it isn't a story. If Muslims attack somebody else, it is a story. I mean, there's a sort of blindness going on. It is because Muslims tend to be the most um, the poorest, the least well represented, the, uh, the most marginalized section tend very often to be that way. Again, MPs, there's four, is that the right to say, four Muslim MPs uh, out of 650, that's less than 1% of the House of Commons, much less than, you know, half a percent of the House of Commons. I think those are the, th that is the thing which must be uh, remedied, because at the moment there's a blindness about the sufferings and the tribulations and the triumphs and the contributions of the Muslim community. By the way, I just got one other thing to say. I remember two other people who wouldn't come on our program. Tony Blair wouldn't and Jack Straw didn't either. <laughs> I wonder why. Andrew, um, perhaps, I mean, one thing that would be really useful to explain is just how does it work on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, if somebody, you know, a politician wants to sort of press this moral panic button about Muslims, as you say, is it just simply a question of 
he rings, you know, a said journalist who he knows to be, you know, partial to this up, or is it editors who come? I mean, how does it actually work on a day-to-day -day basis, especially with our lobby system such as it is? Yeah, how it works is uh, it, it is that I mean, the, how the Jack Straw thing works is, is with the with the veil. Um, he wrote an article for his local newspaper, the, the Lancashire Evening Telegraph. Mm. Then got picked up by the paper, um, and, and thus by the nationals. And everybody just piled in, and nobody really thought about it. Uh, and then all the other politicians in all the other parties thought, God, he seems to be striking a chord with this. We've got to say something about the veil as well. So that's why David Davis chimed in in the quote I gave you. Um, and um, it took it took a couple of days for a, a bit of a backlash to set in. I wrote something. Johnny Friedland in The Guardian wrote something. As you know, he's a Jew, and he said, um, um, if, this was, um, if this was the 1930s, I'd be looking for my passport. Um, and uh, and it, so it sort of went in cycles, but really, it, it is our problem. I mean, no, nobody, nobody had actually done anything to, to promote this kind of outpouring of, of ridiculous nonsense about the veil. But then at some stage, um, which is shameless, I mean, at some stage, there comes a point whereby it's hard to put out that kind of sort of fire uh, because uh, there's no one yeah. within, you know. Well, one sorry, thing, sorry, on. one thing I should have said, I mean, it, it would have helped if there'd been somebody who could have come on and said, look, this is ludicrous, um, you know, it's a piece of clothing, um, it, you know, what does it matter, what difference does it make? Uh, and actually, you, you know, you're it. talking about banning it, I mean, can you imagine, um, mm. you know, that, that's, what they, that's what they do in totalitarian states, mm. and, and, and all it would do is, is just is just further drive a wedge between the community and, and, and the rest of the country. And, and it would have been nice if there could have been somebody who could have come on and said all that. Shameless. From I the mean, community, I mean. Yeah, exactly. I mean, picking up on that point, I mean, are, are these things, I mean, is it much easier said? I mean, if, if, if there was an organization that uh, within the Muslim community that wasn't a lobbying organization as such, but that wanted to pick up and challenge you know, news organizations on inaccuracies, would that actually work? I think it would have a huge effect. I mean, I, I think it, it's a very important priority for the community really to have media lobbying outfits. And I know in a way it's sort of happening a bit in kind of spasmodic ways around the place and individuals are trying to do it. I just think it needs more focus. It's very important for the community. It's very important for the society that these things are challenged and it needs political organization with a, with a small um, P. I mean, to take another case, I mean, when you're saying the fire, when their fires are raging, I mean, the Archbishop of Canterbury's speech about Sharia law earlier this year, I mean, before I actually read it, I'd been listening to the coverage and I thought, you know, he really was a bit, uh, you know, foolish to talk in those ways, knowing what the climate is. When I actually read the speech, I, I couldn't believe how careful he had been to cover every single counter-argument to what he was saying. It was an incredibly reasoned, uh, you know, speech, and it was treated like in the, in, the, in the most ridiculous, hysterical, and inflammatory way by across the media. And I think there is a climate there which needs to be challenged very forcefully. I mean, just to, I mean, you know, I, th I think we should say that there are other aspects of these things that it is possible to do it. I mean, for example, we, we were talking about Al Jazeera the, a moment ago, and I think, I mean, to come back to the colleague from the BBC, I mean, I think that, you know, the BBC and the media in Britain has a lot to learn from the innovations that Al Jazeera has made. You know, it is a much more pluralistic uh, kind of broadcasting station than we're used to. And I think that, you know, it's, it's partly a problem of language. People don't see that. But, I mean, as, it's, as the English language station has come on stream, people still don't really realize that it has challenged many of the norms that are established here. I mean, the BBC, for example, in coverage of international affairs, I think is much more government-orientated than it is um, when, it's, when it's dealing with domestic affairs. I mean, in the case of The Guardian, uh, after, after the 9-11 attacks, we made a decision to try and open up the comment pages on The Guardian to as broad a range of voices from the Muslim and Arab worlds and the Muslim community in Britain as possible. And to be quite frank, there was quite a lot of backlash to that, you know, relentless backlash. People but from government, from inside the paper, uh, from, you know, wider social and political organizations complaining about all these uh, extremists, as they would see it, who were allowed to write in a, a mainstream national paper. So these things are a battle, but they can be challenged. And I think to pick up Raggy's point, I really do think that organization around this issue in the community is, is really a big priority. Just one last sort of supplementary thing I should have said. I mean, 
never underestimate how little most journalists know about Islam. Um, and, and, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons that myths can take hold is that most journalists don't know anything about it. Um, and, uh, and what you perhaps need is, is maybe even something as simple as a website um, which could authoritatively describe some of the common claims made about Islam and, and authoritatively refute them or explain why they're made. And it, I know some, some efforts of that nature are made, but I don't think they're authoritative enough. It needs to, it needs to, be, it needs to look at least impartial and, 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 uh, and, and, and above reproach. It needs to be written by somebody, um, it needs to be written like somebody by a, you know, Oxford academic or something like that. But you need something like that. Okay, we're gonna, we've got about five or a bit more minutes, so I'm going to try and quickly move around three questions. I know there's lots more. This gentleman here first. Hi, uh, my name is Mustafa Kidwai. I've got a general question to the whole panel. Would you agree that on average the British media is more tolerant and sensitive than the European counterpart? And uh, one of the, I'm referring more to the incident with the Danish press. Do you agree that the reason that, in, that didn't occur here in the, in the UK was that Muslims here have got some sort of uh, say and some sort of hold. Very good point. Uh, and go around the table, because there is something about, you know, where does sensitivity cross over into self-censorship? And I'd, I'd like to touch on that for, for everybody. Peter. I think I'm right in saying that the Danish paper had a fairly dodgy past, didn't it? I think that if you looked at its record back into history, that it had some very unpleasant associations. And uh, I think that, um, as a whole, the, notwithstanding the, I hadn't known of the, the Daily Mail's front page in 1935. Really <laughs> yeah. I didn't actually say hooray for the Bachelors after that rally. That <laughs> but I, it comes as a shock to me. Well, but that, the, that rally was a key turning point in discrediting fascism in this country. Anyway, but, go but on. Uh, the point really what I'm making is I do I do think that the. Um, that the mainstream media has a, a more of a sense of responsibility than some continental papers. Well, I, I, how, how mainstream was the Danish paper concerned? In, hmm? um, and I, I, I quarrel actually with uh, Seamus's claim that, that this is a more Islamophobic country than, than any other in Europe. Um, I'm not sure what the evidence is for that. I, I, I don't believe it to be the case. If you look at things like the rate of mixed marriage, for instance, that's quite a good indicator of, 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 uh, of racial integration. It's higher here than elsewhere. Although it is lower among you know, particular communities. I mean, the Pakistani community has a pretty low rate of mixed marriage. The Arab community is a much higher rate. Um, it's not a Muslim thing. It seems to be a, a particular community thing. Uh, so, so I'm not sure I would agree that, that this country is more Islamophobic than anywhere else. It, it has a slightly, arguably, more developed um, uh, engagement with the issue, even if it's not always very pleasant. Seamus, just uh, quickly, if you could. Well, I mean, I was just taking that from the figures in these polls done in the last year or two, and I think it is quite a recent thing. I mean, particularly the Harris poll last autumn, which showed that, you know, for, I mean, for example, the number of people, the proportion of the British population who think that it's impossible to be both British and Muslim uh, is now 30%, and that's more than double the level in France and significantly higher than in the US. So I was, I was taking it from that point of view, really. I mean, I agree that it's a more complicated picture because I think these things are quite fragile and they've happened quite recently. And that's why I think they can be knocked back. I don't, I mean, I think in other ways, you know, there is a much more uh, tolerant underlying atmosphere in Britain. And I mean, not just on the issue of the, of the Danish cartoons, but I mean, if you compare with, you know, mm. Muslims who've lived in France and Britain, yeah. often they say that in, in day to day life, uh, you know, the situation here is significantly better. So I was particularly looking at specific attitudes, and I think it's li linked to the bombings and the war in particular. Okay. What the, very briefly, how does the rest, I mean, particularly the Arab world, I mean, see, I mean, in terms of Islamophobia, Britain compared to continental Europe? I mean, Al Jazeera and many other networks carry yeah. the stories in France and Denmark and elsewhere. I think, in general, it is viewed much more positively yeah. than, than other countries, yes. The British media is viewed uh, much more positively than, than the rest of, of, of Europe. And I think the tradition of, of uh, journalism in this country has inspired many others in many parts of the world. And ha here I, would, I should record that Al Jazeera itself, when it started in 1996, was uh, actually started by 70 journalists who 
who actually, yes, uh, you know, left BBC at that time because BBC Arabic was uh, closed down, and therefore they came and they formed Al Jazeera, and they brought with them, with they brought with them a lot of, you know, traditions, and and four of our editors in chief or chief editors of Al Jazeera are ex BBC journalists actually. Very good. Now I can't remember where the microphone is. Where is it? There, okay, uh, I think we said this gentleman and also then that lady there um, with the blue shawl. This gentleman here at the front. Sorry? Okay, okay, I'll, sorry, we'll go from, you go first, then that gentleman, then that lady. But we'll make it brief and quickly, yeah? Um, we did some research um, a little while back and we asked 65 young Muslims if the media represented them or accurately. And um, zero, none of them said yes. Um, even a 12-year-old innocently said, um, the channels that I watch, there are no Muslims on them. Um, what I want to ask is, why would young Muslims want to get into an industry that they don't trust? There's a problem, I mean, Seamus. To change it. To change it, but also yeah. what would you say to someone who's a Muslim who's thinking about sort of going into the media if they're discouraged because of, you know, a, a sense in which this is not a career for them? A, because of what they read generally, or you know, sense of Islamophobia. Well, of course, I mean, it's not just Muslims who feel like that. I mean, many other minorities, working class people feel like that generally too. Uh, but I mean, I think it really is in, in Muslim interests, in the wider community's interests, in the wider country's interests, that those things change. And, and for all the reasons that we've been talking about. So it's actually the, the, the pressure to get in there and to make these differences. I mean, the, the Muslim journalists I've worked with have made a difference by being there. And it's, it's challenged you know, and uh, not just Muslim journalists, other non-white journalists, other non, uh, you know, indigenous journalists have made a difference to attitudes at my workplace by challenging things in meetings and in the way things are looked at. And so I, th I think it really is an important thing to try and break through those barriers. This gentleman here and then that lady there. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, in w w being an American and just li listening to this panel discussion, I, I want to say thank you to Mr. Kamfar uh, for his discussion because it seems that what, what he was speaking of, which kind of lacked in the others, is the real understanding of the media and its role of not just basically reporting the news, but being more actively involved. Uh, and so the, 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 part, the part that becomes a question is how do Muslims uh, become more active, not in the sense of just saying we don't agree with this, let's condemn this, let's condemn that, but really taking a part and breaking through like some of you have uh, and being real active patrons of the, of the media and really go beyond reporting and making I guess, sound critique of, the, of, of politics. Andrew, is there something that, you know? Well, I mean, I've, I've suggested a few ways. Um, I, I think it's very important to me for Muslims to get involved in the media. And actually, there's quite a lot of appetite for, for, for Muslim journalists. If, you know, there's, a very sh there's, there's, a, there's a serious shortage of them, perhaps for the reasons you described. Um, but, uh, but actually, I think if a decent Muslim reporter came along, um, he or she would be looking at um, loads of offers of work. Um, uh, and obviously there are many good re Muslim reporters in the media, but there aren't enough. Thank you very much for that. And uh, that lady there who's been waiting patiently a long time. Okay, so I'll try and make it brief. Thank you. Uh, Issa Yunusi here. I represent um, a youth organization called Mami. Um, I've been going to a lot of different types of lectures and, um, and being involved in debates. I regularly write into various uh, media channels, newspapers, television, um, uh, media broadcasters, uh, organizations, news channels, but unfortunately I very rarely, if ever, have any of my comments go through in any fair form. Um, you mentioned that there was uh, the veil issue back in 2006. Well, going back another two years, I attended the pro Hijab conference in 2004, and uh, among the comments that my uh, that the youth that I represent wanted me to put forward were things like if the argument for banning the veil, which was the really hot issue at the time, um, if one of the reasons for banning the veil being put, put forward was things like peer pressure, that young girls are being encouraged or forced or being peer pressured into putting this veil on which they don't understand, therefore it should be banned altogether. Um, if that is true, then we should be banning things like the bikini and the mini skirt and the glamour magazine, which is making All people right. kill themselves okay. over, over uh, 
not having the body beautiful okay. image. How do we tackle these things? You said we should be writing in. Um, when the veil issue was very, very big, mm. I did write in, I did I call know. in. Nobody listened except one local newspaper which misprinted and misquoted me entirely. And after that, you know, I've almost been blacklisted where I write in and I don't even get any responses. How does the Muslim community tackle that when really mm. we are trying? I, I, I don't want to ignore your question. I mean, I appreciate it. But I mean, we have sort of delved into this issue quite a bit about sort of getting more Muslim voices in the media and what the Muslim community can do to try and tackle, you know, um, uh, articles and things that aren't true. But uh, we've got such limited time. I want to just try and get other questions uh, directly about our audience. Try that lady right at the back. I think we've only got time for two more. Um, but try to make the questions, I mean, specifically uh, directed at, at, at the panel. Thank you. Um, thank you. I just have um, a very brief question. Um, do you not think that reporting of legitimate issues within the Muslim community as well suffer? Because people are afraid of falling either into the camp yeah. of Islamophobe or apologist. Um, I know personally that many Muslims fear um, being attacked by their own community or if they try and defend their communities, hmm. they're accused of having a Stockholm Syndrome. Very good question. Andrew, you picked up on this earlier, saying that it's important to distinguish between the media as those, you know, that which is distorting uh, issues and that which is you know, genuinely probing and, and uh, questioning, because there are the issues within our community. Yeah. What the, there is a distinction, isn't there, between defaming or, you know, distorting and genuinely probing and asking about radicalism and these other kind of issues, isn't there? There are issues that should always be discussed. I think every issue could be discussed. There is nothing that we could hide away and say this is taboo, you know. But the way that it is discussed and the, the perspective of discussion and the analytical framework that we have with it is very important. Before that, you spoke about the Danish cartoons, for example. Okay, I mean, that issue created a huge problem uh, in the Arab world, and uh, when I was asked actually about my opinion, I said that there is a clash between two models of understanding. Individualism that, you know, allows people to express their views as they wish, and the other model, which in my opinion, the paradigm of interpretation, which is collectiveness in the Islamic world. And what is sacred uh, in, in, in this collectiveness should be always re respected, because the society, is not less than the individual in respecting the boundaries uh, and, and the rights uh, of it. Andrew, you made that point. What were you trying to get at? And do you yeah. think that you know there is there is a sense in which people sort of uh, are not willing to go into things because of the label of Islamophobia? Well, I, I, I'm actually more encouraged than the, than the speaker questioner. I, I think there is an increasing number of, uh, of Muslims willing to come out and say. Uh, and the sort of heads above the parapet on this. Uh, I think that's one of the most encouraging signs, actually, for the community. Peter, very briefly. Yeah, no, okay, on, sorry. One last question, and I'm going to try and go over here um, because we haven't had a sort of chance. Go to that lady just by you in the in the in the brown jacket. Last one, I think. Of, of Hi. Running over. Um, so we've had much talk about sort of Muslims engaging in sort of dialogue and expressing themselves. So we've got a panel of journalists here. Are any of you going to write about Islam Expo in your papers today or tomorrow? Well, the news, news desks work in very mysterious ways and it's very hard mm. to get certain things past the editors. But Seamus, you go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to say in answer to both you and the lady who was speaking earlier, that I think we haven't talked enough about the internet which for anyone who's working in the media is just a colossal and answer the question development is just coming <laughs> to the answer. so uh, the answer to the question is yes because we're doing a special uh, blog on the comment the guardians comment is free website on Islam Expo and the, the other point I wanted to make about the internet to the lady over here is that if you can't get through in the more traditional ways come on the threads on the pieces I mean on which are on debate online, debating these issues all the time. And I often feel we don't have enough Muslim voices coming on to counter attacks on the uh, Muslim community and Muslim issues. So I think the internet has opened up all sorts of possibilities which didn't exist before and which need to be exploited more fully. 
Thank you very much. I'd just like to end the um, session by just asking each of the panelists to give a sort of closing comment if they can, and especially, I mean, I mean, where the lay of the land is at the moment on, on, on this question of the media's performance and, and role in, in reflecting the media or trying to set the agenda, and uh, whether they're pessimistic or optimistic as the, as the way things are going. Start off with you, Wada. I think my, my advice would be is for, for, for the sister who spoke earlier that keep it trying. And I think we should be held accountable as media for what we do. We need, uh, as audience and public, to develop our tools, to use whatever available. The internet now is opening for us new ways of communication. I think we need to organize ourselves and to hold media accountable for the discourse that, is, uh, that the media is using. Uh, therefore, I do always believe that the, the public should be uh, the guardian of the decency and the guardian of the professional standards that we use because sometimes yes there is a pressure and sometimes there is commercial considerations there are political considerations and you can be much better judges than sometimes ourselves even in judging what is good and what is bad as far as media is concerned Seamus the other thing is to, is to work collectively I mean you know putting on one side what Andrew said earlier about your guy Brennan who seems to be a one-man band for the victims of crime. I mean, I think working not just as individuals but in groups and with collective organizations is much more likely to have an impact and effect and you can focus your work much more effectively in trying to change the things we've been talking about. Andrew. Um, well, well, take the power. Don't be passive victims. Take the power. But you've got to frame how you try to exercise your representations to the media in a way that's most likely to be effective. And I think the way that mo all, all media, at least formally, pay lip service to the idea that they must tell the truth, that they tell the truth. That's what, that's what, their, that's what their stated purpose is, even if they don't manage it, uh, even if they don't want to manage it, that's what they claim to manage. Um, they do not necessarily all claim. Uh, if, if so I think you need. I, need, I think you need. When you approach the media, you need to approach them in terms of of, factual, uh, of, of, of not telling the truth and factualism, rather than in terms of Islamophobia. They, they they care to be seen to be telling the truth. They care less about being seen to be Islamophobic. Very good point, Peter. Last word. Yes, I think we need to change a British public culture. Events like this are part of that. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure we will. I do fundamentally feel optimistic. I thought some very creative and interesting ideas from the panel. I think a very authoritative website which would educate people and would be a, a sort of um, a place where you could go which was utterly reliable, a sort of dictionary uh, of Islam and, uh, and even current events. I thought the idea of a fact check where you know, where stories which are false are immediately exploded and challenged. And then I think you had to hunt down these false stories, like the poor bus driver who was lied about in the sun. Is, just don't let that rest. I mean, that, you know, that, that story hmm? make force a major correction. Get, get alongside that bus driver and, and fund him to sue the paper for libel. Yeah. Thank you very much to all of you, and thanks very much to our uh, panel, who I think have been great, to Wada Khanfar, Seamus Milne, Andrew Gilligan, and Peter Oborn. Thank you very much.